want to welcome you to SJC's online worship experience. We're glad you're here. Let's, Let's do, do this. <laughs> so are we more like tourists or pilgrims in our discipleship as we follow Jesus? Hey, everybody, welcome to SJC's online worship experience. We're so excited that you're with us today. If you're new, if it's your first time, we want to welcome you. You're in the right spot, and we pray God's blessings over you today. We're going to unpack this whole issue of discipleship in a new message series called The Disciples' Way. It's going to be a powerful time of worship, prayer, time in God's Word. So let's get ready to do it, everybody. God has given me the tongue of a teacher, 
that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. The word of the Lord. How deep fathers are for us How vast beyond all measure That he should give his only son To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of seeing Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, What do people say that I am? And they answered him, 
John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Go behind me, Satan, for you are set in your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For that will it profit for what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this unfaithful and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of the Lord. Well, hey, everybody, we're all familiar with the old saying, tough times don't build your character, they reveal your character. I actually believe it's both. Hardship can absolutely create an opportunity for growth and development, character development. Scripture even suggests this in numerous places, but at the same time, I believe it also reveals our present maturity or capacity. It can be a barometer that shows us where we are right now. There's a famous story of the great Anglican preacher, evangelist, and founder of the Methodist tradition, John Wesley. After a failed ministry in the American colonies in the middle of the 18th century, Wesley boards a ship to sail back to England to regroup. On the journey home, the sailing vessel met with perilous seas that threatened the ship and the lives of all aboard. Wesley could find no peace, no rest, no faith. He feared for his life and his very soul before God. There was a group on the ship, some Moravian Christians, uh, who in the midst of the storm sang hymns and songs of praise and they prayed and they exuded a faith and a peace in Christ in the midst of the peril. This contrast spoke powerfully to Wesley who realized that his Christian life and ministry to that point had been more about his own strength and agenda than simple trust in Jesus. This incident proved to be a catalyst for Wesley who a short time after making it back to England found himself attending a Moravian Bible study and worship gathering one evening where Wesley would put his trust in the finished work of Christ once and for all and nothing was ever the same in his life again. There's no doubt that we have all been through some form of testing over the last year and a half or so. We could choose to ignore it, not acknowledge it, but nonetheless, the impact of COVID-19 and this pandemic has been far reaching and over a sustained period of time. The ongoing disruption of the pandemic has tested us in practical ways, shifting our routines, habits, and lifestyles. It also has presented a great challenge to our spiritual vitality and the rhythms of our discipleship. How has the pandemic disrupted your discipleship, if at all? How has your fellowship changed or been challenged? How has online worship and limited in-person worship impacted you? Is your faith encouraged? How would you describe your relationship to God in these days? How is your soul today? I believe for many reasons that this is a season for the church to consider again the essence of Christian discipleship. And for the next several weeks, we're gonna explore what it means to follow Jesus in a message series called The Disciples' Way. In our gospel passage today, Mark chapter eight, we get a strong word from Jesus about the nature of discipleship. He is the disciple's master, of course, and to be a disciple of Jesus is to come under Jesus's authority. When I myself first stepped onto the road, the pathway of discipleship, I can remember thinking, you know, following Jesus really is a challenge. And the further I went along, I came to a sobering reality. Following Jesus is not just a challenge, it's impossible. Impossible, that is, on my own. 
impossible on my own terms, impossible if I insist on being in the driver's seat, which is exactly what Jesus warns his followers of in Mark chapter 8. He says, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat, I am. Don't run from suffering, embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help, he says, is of no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to saving yourself, your true self. Hold that thought for just a moment and let's back up. Today we also read a passage of scripture from Isaiah 50. It's a passage that fits into a group of passages from Isaiah. Collectively, they're called the servant songs of Isaiah. And as we discussed last week, Isaiah was a great prophet of hope. Of course, there's plenty of judgment, just judgment at that found in Isaiah, but God's word never ends there. And especially through his messenger, Isaiah, salvation, redemption, and new life always have the final word. One of the prominent prophetic themes of Isaiah is the mysterious servant of the Lord figure who emerges to save God's people. Looking through the lens of the New Testament then, it's obvious to see that Isaiah's suffering servant is indeed Jesus the Christ. Passages like we explored last week in Isaiah 35 forecast what unfolds under Jesus' ministry. The servant song passage today from Isaiah 50 does the same. It has to do with the role of hardship, suffering, and the quiet confidence of trusting God in the face of challenge. It sounds a lot like the challenge of Christian discipleship. The passage is a muse through the voice of the servant. It's a soliloquy, a literary device in which the speaker is actually talking to himself out loud and perhaps knowingly to a group of listeners. He says, quote, the Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning, he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught, unquote. He goes on to muse that even in the face of trial, he won't be disgraced or put to shame because God is there. He will uphold. Now, the imagery here is really, really rich. The servant is one who has been taught. He awakens day after day, and he is a learner. He is under the tutelage of the Lord. In this picture, you get the sense that the servant is much more of a pilgrim than a tourist which is a great way to challenge our own perspective of discipleship. Am I a pilgrim on the way or just a tourist checking out the scene? In his classic book, uh, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, the late pastor, author, theologian, and scholar Eugene Peterson delves into this pilgrim versus tourist idea of discipleship. He says, quote, religion in our time has been captured by a tourist mindset. Religion is understood as a um, visit to an attractive site um, to be made when we have adequate leisure. The religious life is defined by the latest and newest Zen, faith healing, human potential, parapsychology, successful living, choreography, and the chancel Armageddon. We'll try anything, he says, until something else comes along. Everyone's in a hurry. They've adopted the lifestyle of a tourist and only want the high points. The Christian life cannot mature under such conditions and in such ways, close quote. Peterson contrasts the tourist mindset with that of a disciple or pilgrim. He says a disciple is a learner, but not in the academic setting of a schoolroom, rather at the work site of a craftsman. We do not acquire information about God, he writes, but skills and faith. I love that. Finally, he says this about being a pilgrim. Being a pilgrim tells us we are people who spend our lives going someplace, going to God, and whose path for getting there is the way, Jesus Christ, close quote. Is your life exuding the characteristics of a pilgrim or a tourist? Am I in a hurry for God to respond to my list of needs, or am I waking each day in a posture of that of a listener, in the mold of a learner, with the mindset of a servant? Here's what's so remarkable about all of this. Uh, God not only calls us to be disciples, to come under his tutelage, but he himself has gone before us. Jesus is the perfect disciple maker because he in fact is the first disciple. He's worthy of calling you forth toward Christian pilgrimage because Jesus is the first pilgrim. As Jesus calls the first disciples, he's living out in real time before their very eyes, the passion of discipleship before God. 
He's not a tourist. He's not feeding uh, on the frenzy of the tourist mentality, which was always a temptation for Jesus in his popular ministry. Jesus wasn't just a Lord or a king barking out orders only, but he was a disciple, a learner, even through the veil of suffering. The writer of Hebrews says, although he was a son, Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. In Isaiah's song, the servant goes on to say to himself, the Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks um, to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and from spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Uh, Therefore, he goes on to say, I've set my face like a flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Again, this is up close imagery of the future suffering that Jesus experienced as the Lord, uh, the Lord who indeed came to serve. It calls to mind the motif of the wounded healer, which seems to be at the core of Christian discipleship. It's the first thing Jesus describes about following him. If you follow me, there will be a cross to bear, he says. You will take on the mantle of a wounded healer, which is the title of another classic Christian meditation on discipleship by the late Henri Nouwen. He poses this question. He says, quote, who can listen to a story of loneliness and despair without taking the risk of experiencing similar pains in his own heart and even losing his precious peace of mind? In short, now and asks, who can take away suffering without entering into it? Jesus, the suffering servant, the first disciple, the first pilgrim, entered into it and did not withhold anything. Jesus' life, of course, is singular and unrepeatable, but Jesus sets the pattern for all who would be his disciples. You and I are not Jesus, but our life is hidden in his, illuminated by his, and takes on the distinct flavor of Jesus, including suffering and a practice of self-giving that mystifies and heartens a weary world. A tourist can rarely point out the way for others when they're lost, but a pilgrim, a disciple invested in the path can say, walk with me and I'll show you the way, which is at the heart of our discipleship. We become so acquainted with the way of Christ, committed to the pilgrim road, come what may, each day awakening with a listening ear, each day relinquishing control, refusing lordship, Uh, of the exalted self in exchange for the lordship of the exalted son, bowing in grateful servitude, each day taking on the heart of a learner, willing to be taught again and again to see once more for the thousandth time or for the first time, which is why Isaiah mentions the fruit of a disciple, the ministry of a wounded healer. We have something to say to the weary traveler. Listen to the words of Isaiah one more time. He says, the Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. The beauty of Christian discipleship is that it moves us outside of ourselves. It refuses just to be an inward focused spirituality that collapses in on itself. And it becomes the opportunity to follow in the pattern of Jesus, the wounded healer, the suffering servant. And in that journey, we become an extension of Christ's ministry to the world in a small way, unique to our gifts and to our setting, to our age and to our moment. We become ready to enter into the sufferings of our friends, of our neighbors, and even of our enemies, that they may see or just catch a glimpse of what it is to know Jesus. And when we come alongside a weary traveler looking for the way, we will be ready to answer. So brothers and sisters, What will it be for us, tourist or pilgrim, sightseer or disciple? Let us pray. Jesus, my suffering servant king, Jesus, my wounded healer, I confess I'm prone to being a religious tourist. Lord, set my heart on pilgrimage to follow you. Renew in me the heart of a disciple, a learner, a listener, a cross bearer, and even a wounded healer, just like you, Lord. All these fears
I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The fourth day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Christian Church. The communion of saints. The forgiveness for sins. The resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. O God, you have made one blood of all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Everybody, thank you so much for connecting with us today for our online worship experience. We hope that God is blessing you in powerful ways. It's always a joy to connect together. And I want to invite you uh, to be a part of something else that's coming up here at SJC. It's our Alpha Series. It starts September 30th. Uh, it'll be offered in person here at our SJC campus and online. So wherever you may be connecting with us around the world, you can participate in Alpha Online with us or if you're local, join us for Alpha in person. Again, that starts September 30th. It's going to be an incredible eight-week journey as we explore the Christian life together in a welcoming, friendly atmosphere. You can find out more at alphawilmington.com and register and hope that you'll do that. I want to thank you so much for your partnership uh, with us in this season in stewardship, time, treasure, talent, people giving their lives in so many different kinds of ways for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of our mission and vision. And we're so thankful for you, thankful for your financial stewardship in particular today and, and want to encourage you that you can continue to give financially to the mission and vision of our church by simply mailing in a check to the address at the bottom of the screen. You can give online by going to our website and hitting the giving button, or you can give by text safely and securely. Just enter the numbers at the bottom of the screen and follow the prompts. And we so appreciate each and every gift, large and small. They really add up uh, to make a difference so that we can continue uh, to make an impact for the sake of the name of Jesus in our community and beyond. So God bless you today in your giving. Now 
us say together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and the, for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives. By giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all of our days through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us forevermore. Amen. Wow, what an amazing time we've had together today in worship. Thank you so much for being a part of it with us. Our prayer for you is that you've been inspired and blessed, encouraged and challenged in your walk with Jesus. We'll be back next week with part two of our message series called The Disciples Way. And we look forward to that so, so much. We hope that you'll stay connected with us moving forward. You can find us anywhere and everywhere on social media at S-J-C-I-L-M. Hope you'll connect with us there. Remember as you go forward today and into your week that Jesus loves you. He really, really does. And friends, life is short. We don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So let us be swift to love and make haste to be kind. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Until next time, take care, everybody.